Hello and welcome to Weekend Watch Repair. My name's Adam. I appreciate you joining me here. On the bench is a Seiko 6139-6005 from November of 1972, most commonly referred to as a Pogue. This is my first ever video and not having any background in audiovisual stuff at all, this is going to be full of errors. There's going to be things out of focus, uh, poor editing choices, me forgetting that I'm filming and having my hands in the way, but you have to start somewhere and this is my attempt. So to start disassembly here, I've got the back removed and I am beginning by removing the oscillating weight. Remember me talking about things being out of focus and hands being in the way. So you've probably noticed there's a significant difference in the picture between the two cameras I'm showing in this video. Uh, the one you see here with me pulling that oscillating weight out, uh, that's on my microscope. And this camera right here is on a uh, external camera. So I'm just recording with these two pieces because that's basically all I have. So now I am, oh good, out of focus shot there, Adam. So now I'm beginning to remove the automatic winding works. On these Seikos, they just did it so brilliantly. Uh, as when we take this off, if this is your first time seeing one of these being taken apart, um, I mean, they just did it with so few parts because of the magic lever system. It's so just simple, it's genius. And uh, I'm a big fan. So now we're gonna take this plate off here. This has the bearing in it that the magic lever rotates around. You can see once the light catches or catches it correctly that there is just a hundred times more lubrication in there than there should be. This is the magic lever. Um, it The paws on each end are designed in such a way that no matter if that rotates to the left or to the white by the direction of the oscillating weight, it will rotate that winding gear in the same direction. And you can see all of that oil on that base plate as well. That's just way too much. This is the transmission wheel, if I remember correctly, is what Seiko calls it. And that's what provides the, transfers the energy from the winding works to the barrel to wind the watch. So next here, it is time to remove the movement ring inside this watch. And on these 6139s and Seiko 6138s, uh, that movement ring also retains the chronograph pushers. So you have to have those depressed when you remove that, but uh, you have to keep your hands on them. Otherwise they can go flying. On this first one here, there's a spring inside of it that on that first pusher remained inside the case. You can see the tip of it hanging out, but uh, there, that spring came out. And now I'm just going to grab this other spring here and get that thing out of the way. Next up, it's time to remove the crown. I really like using the flat point of my spring bar tool because I find it's usually just the perfect size to fit in and press down on the setting lever to remove the, the stem. Again, sorry about the focus. It won't be the last time you see it, but future videos will be better. So now with the chronograph pushers, crown and movement ring all out of the way, it's time to remove the movement from the case. Here I am uh, trying to figure out the best way to place that watch so it's in frame on the camera. Um, again, I'm new at this, but I just put it on a movement cushion, flip it over. I usually tap the crystal a little bit just to in case it wants to stick at all, but there it is out of the movement. So we're back to the microscope view now, and I am going to reinstall the crown so that I can set the hands in such an orientation that uh, it makes them easier to remove. My microscope records in 2K, so you'll notice the video quality is not as good as the uh, desktop camera, and it doesn't have autofocus, so I have to use a fixed focus point and kind of adjust it like you see here. I try to do all that stuff uh, and re remove all those deals in editing, but I just kind of wanted you guys to see that. So what we do here is I put a piece of plastic over the hands to protect the dial and hands from any marks while using the hand removal tools to remove 
the hands. So once those are out of the way, we'll put the plastic back on here and we can remove the subdial hands for the minute recording wheel. This wheel is, it's, it's, I mean, take in mind, we're on a microscope camera here, so it, things look a lot bigger than what they are. That thing is extremely small and the, the distance between the underside of the hand to the dial is very tiny. So it, um, it's just super delicate. Funny thing is when I first started getting into watch repair and, uh, I would remove a, either a small seconds hand or like this, a chronograph sub register hand. Sometimes that hand will stick to the plastic and I would pull that plastic away, not thinking about it and spend an hour or two on the floor trying to find the tiniest watch hand. So if you're doing this kind of work, be very careful and very aware of where those hands are when you pull that plastic off. So here, um, all of my focus issues aside, I am removing the, or I am loosening the screws for the dial feet. Uh, there's a pretty good photo or a pretty good image from the microscope. And those screws just put tension on those dial feet just to kind of hold the dial in place. But once you get those loose, this dial came off here super easy. Sometimes it takes a little bit of persuasion with a flat screwdriver blade, but that one came apart real nicely. I am taking all of the hands and the dial. I'm going to put this in the protective case here and won't touch it until all the repairs on the watch are done and it's time to reassemble. I'll put that six feet away just so that I don't bump it or nothing happens to that. Cause if generally, if you mark up a dial, it's, it's done for. So on the dial side of the movement, the day wheel shown here is held on by a little C-clip. Um, those of who work on Seiko's a lot, one thing they'll really notice that that C-clip has a flat side and a rounded side. And always make sure the rounded side goes downwards so you can get something underneath it. So that one came off real easy. It, uh, it indexes off of that gear that you see on the other side. So with that out of the way, we can begin disassembly of the dial side of the movement which is going to begin with this cover plate that also acts as the uh, spring tension for the day wheel. There's four screws on this particular plate. These three here I've pre-loosened and uh, it just wasn't, it was cut during the edit process, but I loosened those three screws. Uh, I think the focus was just horrible in that part of the video. But uh, this one here is me removing the fourth screw. And uh, once that is out of the way, that plate will come off and uh, we can begin disassembly of the motion works and calendar works and keyless works, which is what comprise the dial side of this watch. So as I pull this plate off here, uh, I always inspect both sides of a part when I remove it, but uh, on here you'll see this little gear was stuck on the wheel when I removed it and it was just because of there's so much lubrication on it. That is the intermediate gear between the hour wheel and the calendar wheel. And you can see it's kind of got two steps of gears here that interact with those two wheels. I put it back on just for the sake of showing you what it looks like assembled and when it isn't pulled off when the cover plate's removed. So this here is the uh, setting the spring for the date wheel. That is held under tension. Uh, it's generally common practice to... Uh, use some sort of tool in there to keep it from flying when you remove it. But once that's removed, the, uh, the date wheel can come off. The date wheel is held onto the movement by that cover plate that we previously removed. That's what secures it. Okay. So we're going to start here by removing the day date corrector lever. Uh, that is the lever that moves as you push the crown in, it engages, uh, the mechanism to uh, advance manually advance the day or the date wheel depending upon how deeply you push in the crown the next part to be removed is the date corrector spring this spring is under a lot of tension so what i generally like to do is just loosen the screw and then that kind of gives me a little bit of play and then i'll release the tension on that spring as shown there and then I can remove the spring safely without any fear of it flying away. It's just a lot safer. Even though that is a pretty large part, it wouldn't be too terrible to find on the floor. That thing 
is under a lot of tension, and I just don't want to see it go flying. With that out of the way, and uh, with my hands in the way, I'm sorry you can't see it. Again, I forget that I'm filming and uh, have my hands where it would normally be if I was doing this without a camera. Uh, it's time to remove the calendar mechanism. On this movement, the calendar works is real simple. It's only three pieces, not including the screw. This first one is the day finger. That's what um, engages the day wheel and makes it move. The second one here, that's the date wheel. Uh, that little finger that comes off at the six o'clock position where that wheel was sitting is what engages the, the date wheel. And uh, that's the driving wheel that interacts with that wheel that came off with the cover plate earlier, that uh, intermediate wheel that I'm removing now. And just that simple assembly is what automatically advances those wheels at the at midnight when you, uh, when you have your watch set up correctly. So this is the hour wheel. There's a cover plate that covers the minute wheel in this intermediate wheel that uh, it got chopped out during uh, video editing just basically due to my inexperience. But uh, the intermediate wheel and the, the hour wheel come out next, uh, as you see here. Here I'm just inspecting the underside of that uh, part, just looking for wear. Next to come off is the cannon pinion. These cannon pinions are press fit, and uh, I really like to use a cannon pinion removal tool. It just ensures that it grips it and lifts it directly upwards and uh you don't take a chance on damaging anything uh doing it that way i've used presto tools and i've used tweezers and they all work but it it kind of foolproofs it and i really like using that tool so the only thing that remains on the dial side of the movement is the keyless works and uh at least in my limited experience in typical seiko fashion it's either brilliantly designed with very few parts or horribly overcomplicated with a ton of parts. This one being the former. This first part here is the setting lever spring. Uh, it also acts as a cover plate as most watch movements do. What I would like to do here is loosen the screws and then take tension off of that spring. And then uh, once the, the part no longer has the ability to fly away, I'll then finish removing the screws as you see here. And uh, we'll just remove that part. There's actually a third function for this uh, for this particular part. It also extends over the stem and actually uh, press, puts pressure down on the uh, setting lever. Uh, so it's just smart. This one here is a combination yoke and yoke spring all in one part. Again, they just simplified it down to just the absolute basics and the parts function perfectly. It's just... I don't know why more watch companies don't do it. That is the setting lever. Uh, that nub you see there on the top of that part, that's what I pressed down earlier to uh, to pull the crown out when we were taking the watch out of the movement. So that's a much better view of that crown than what we had earlier. And the last part to come out is the clutch wheel. Technically speaking, that's not the last part. There's the, the shock setting and uh, cap jewel for the balance, but... Uh, I handle those in a separate operation. We'll sh show those later. So now we move over to the dial side of the movement. And the first thing I like to do after power has been uh, removed from the watch, and in this one it has, is to remove the balance. On this one here, there is uh, two screws holding this balance in. I really like these balances in these 6138 and 6139 movements where the balance extends uh, across the balance is, where the bridge extends across the balance assembly. It can make for some interesting times trying to reassemble it uh, and to get that back in. But uh, I just, from, from a structural standpoint, I, I really like it. So here, what I'm doing is just using the most gentlest pressure possible to lift that up and uh, get that where it's easier to just to get my tweezers underneath it, to lift it out. Uh, when I remove a balance, I, I like to lift it up and just gently move it around in the tiniest bit of circles here. It's a tip I picked up from a friend of mine. Here's a close-up view of that balance. Uh, I just wanted to show you the spring's in great shape. It's flat on all the rings are concentric. I'm pausing the video here to note something very specific before we move forward. 
When I bought this watch, one of the things the the previous owner said was wrong with it was that the minute recording wheel wouldn't reset to zero. For those of you who are hobbyists like myself, probably noticed this earlier during the disassembly video, but I want to point something out here that I'm going to point an arrow to right now. So what you see here is the bearing point for the minute recording wheel in the chronograph bridge. There should be a steel bearing that that wheel rotates inside of, but in this case, it's just completely missing. In the following video where we do the repair and reassembly of this watch, I was going to be doing the barrel arbor jewel upgrades, both the upper and lower. I knew I was going to do that before I ever even opened up this watch to begin with. But being that this chronograph bridge is missing the minute recording wheel uh, steel bushing or steel bearing, it still has the intermediate wheel bearing in there, but I'm going to use this opportunity to jewel both of those as well. That will be a first for me. I've done the barrel upgrades before, but I've never had one of the minute recording wheel bearings in the chronograph bridge be missing before. So this will be a first for me. And with that out of the way, back to the regular disassembly video. So here we're removing the chronograph bridge. There's three screws that hold this in place. The first screw uh, got cut during processing or editing. The, here we're removing the second and the third screws. I loosen, but before I remove the last screw, I like to just loosen it and remove tension on that hammer click spring as you just saw. That just kind of avoids that thing kind of popping off when you remove that last screw, just in case. Uh, generally they don't, but it's just kind of a precaution that I like to take. And so with all the screws removed and the tension released, we can remove the chronograph bridge. Here I'm just inspecting the underside of it just to make sure everything's looking okay. And from here we have access to all of the chronograph parts. Uh, we're going to begin here with that intermediate wheel that uh, that's the one that still had the bearing in place on the chronograph bridge, but it's going to be upgraded when we, re uh, when we reassemble the watch. Next here is the minute recording wheel. This is the wheel that the minute that the, that tiny little hand on that sub register actually mounts to the tip of the, the, uh, the pivot on that, uh, on that wheel. Next here, I apologize for having half of the watch not visible in my microscope camera, but I'm removing the operating lever spring for the uh, chronograph pusher. I'll try to make sure I get a better view of that reinstalling it. This here is the hammer spring, and it's got quite an odd shape, and uh, you have to kind of take it, loosen it in stages, uh, being very careful without it going flying. I've had one of these go flying before. And I spent probably an hour and a half looking for it, never found it, ordered a replacement, and then a day and a half before the replacement arrived, I ended up finding it. So that is the hammer that kind of popped off when I removed the spring. I'm just putting it back in just to show you kind of how it mounts. And this takes me a minute to get in set correctly in the right orientation. But that hammer there uh, engages the hearts on the chronograph wheel and the minute recording wheel to reset them to zero when you push the reset pusher. But, uh, that comes off that hammers, you know, got some marking on it. It, um, it, it's, it's seen a lot of use, but it's still quite serviceable. So the next items to come off are the first and second coupling levers for the chronograph. These levers are what engage with the chronograph wheel or fifth wheel that either uh, engage or disengage the chronograph function of the watch. When they press inwards in towards the chronograph, it gets in there and engages the clutch and separates the chronograph mechanism from the, from the fifth wheel. And when they separate out that clutch, uh, engages between the, the chronograph mechanism and the fourth wheel, and it lets the chronograph run. So I'm, um, the reason I'm kind of fiddling with this little screw here that comes off is this is a really special screw and it's got kind of a unique, uh, shoulder on it. And it, it's just, uh, it's, it's unique to the watch. There's only one of them and it fits in that one specific spot just to, uh, keep those two, 
uh, levers in place, but it allows movement underneath them for them to, to move, but it keeps them from coming out. So here I am uh, removing those levers. One thing that isn't shown on the on the edit is um, when you first do disassembly, it is helpful to have the chronograph mechanism engaged before you even start assembly. On this one, it wasn't. And uh, those levers were engaged into the clutch and the chronograph wheel, and you couldn't pull them out. So in, in editing, it got lost, but I uh, engaged the mechanism internally to move the levers into a correct spot where it made them easy to remove. So here we are removing the column wheel, and this is where all of the, the chronograph engaging and disengaging the, the reset functions and all of that interact with this wheel to kind of when, you know, make sure everything runs together properly, that the reset function can't work. If the chronograph is running, the chronograph have to, has to be stopped. But, um, that wheel comes off. It's kind of got some special lubrication requirements, um, just so that, cause there's so many interacting parts with it. But once that wheel comes off, there's a steel bushing that uh, goes in there. And that little thing is small and easy to lose. So it's really important to keep track of that. One thing not shown on here that uh, got cut out during post, but I figured this would be a good time to add it in is there's an intermediate minute recording wheel holder. And it's that little L shaped plate right next to that center chronograph wheel shown to the right of it that did get removed. It just didn't get on camera, but here we're, we're we are removing the ratchet wheel. Uh, that's held in by one screw. Um, just, uh, here's a really good inspection. And this is kind of surprising. A lot of times you'll see a lot of wear on the underside of that ratchet wheel and maybe just due to some, uh, side shake issues, uh, on that barrel, but it looked great. The, uh, the click came off as well there. And so now we are down to removing the, uh, the bridge on this watch and we're getting really, really close to getting this thing disassembled again. Uh, sorry for the focus issues again. You know, I caught this one midway that my hand was in the way and the autofocus on the camera was picking up my hand and not the watch. I'm going to change some focus settings in the next video and put it to a fixed focus point instead of autofocus. And I'm thinking that will, that will help a lot. So again, I apologize for my constant focus issues, but with this, uh, we remove three screws uh, to get this out. This last one here is kind of sunk down a little bit. Uh, it's kind of a, the countersink's pretty deep, uh, on the bridge plate. So I just use some Rodico to remove that screw. And with that, uh, we can remove the plate. We just be, uh, do it very gently just to make sure we don't damage any pivots while we're removing it, but just checking the underside of the plate to make sure that everything is in proper order and everything looks pretty good. No, major issues. The jewels are surprisingly clean. I don't think, I think this watch again was worked on and I think it was cleaned, but, um, not reassembled properly and over oiled by quite a bit. So here's the heart of the watch as, uh, on these, uh, on the, on these movements, this chronograph wheel here is much more expensive and much harder to replace than, than the, than the balance. It, um, there is a special way to lubricate it, which we'll go over when we reassemble it. But, um, with that out of the way, we can remove the barrel and we'll disassemble that at the end of the video. Past that, we have the third wheel coming out next. I kind of have a love hate relationship with the third wheel on these movements. One of my earlier watches that I'd worked on, um, I didn't pay close enough attention and didn't have the bottom pivot in the jewel. So when I went to install the bridge, I put way too much force on it. I was inexperienced. Um, and, uh, ended up bending the pivot on that and breaking the jewel. So, um, uh, lesson learned, uh, money out of my pocket to get a replacement part, but I haven't made that mistake since. So in order to remove the rest of the parts, first off, we got to remove the, uh, pallet fork. So the pallet, uh, fork bridge came out. Uh, next is the pallet fork itself. And these things are tiny. It is just, it, it's difficult to capture. Again, you're looking at this under a microscope and, um, I mean, you can tell it's part, it's how small it is in comparison with everything else, but it's just so tiny. Next is the escape wheel. It, uh, again, another super tiny one. Uh, 
just be really delicate when you're pulling this off. And all we have left is the, um, the uh, center wheel and the center wheel bridge. That bridge just has one screw, as you see here. You have to be kind of careful between that screw. Sometimes when, when they mix screws together, it, uh, it it's easy to confuse that with the uh, screws for the pallet fork bridge, but they are slightly different. I kind of have a system to keep all of my screws organized. Uh, I kind of developed it after my first couple watches, and it just, the system is probably overkill, but it works for me. But with that bridge out of the way, the center wheel comes out, and that is everything except for the mainspring. So on the mainspring, we just uh, separate it as such as shown here. The uh, Seiko uses, uh, in these movements, they use what they call the S4 grease. It's, it's a black grease. And uh, generally speaking, these things look horrendous when you open them up. And really, it's just because of the lubrication. This one here is not even remotely close to as bad as I've seen them in the past. But it is quite filthy. The barrel arbor can sometimes be a little of a bit, bit of a pain to get out, but uh, I, uh, I I do a little kind of video cut here to sh show it out afterwards and uh, show it to you under the microscope so you can get an idea of what it looks like. But uh, we un this, unwind these by hand, uh, doing our very best to not let it completely fly out. These can be reused uh, depending upon its condition. This one here is going to end up being replaced. The, um, it could, it could be reused, but once I get this thing fully unwound, you can kind of see it's not completely flat, but, um, once you get it started, you just unwind it by hand. As you see here, I always kind of, before I do this, I kind of clear my bench of any parts or anything. Cause as that spring rotates around, I don't want it, you know, pushing a small part off my bench or anything. And then I, after I've gone through the trouble of trying to keep everything organized during disassembly, um, I don't want anything flying, but that's it. I sure hope you appreciate the video. Uh, I'm going to looking forward to uploading more and thanks so much. We'll see you on the next one.